GE for Cortical Error. My name is James Nagel. Welcome to The Irish Nation Lives. The sentencing to death of 18-year-old Kevin Barry in October of 1920 caused considerable anger and despair amongst the Republican movement. The IRA Director of Intelligence, Michael Collins, desperately attempted to organise a rescue, and calls were made to commute his sentence, given his youth. Instead, the British government declared that he would be hanged as a criminal on the 1st of November, the day after the funeral of Terence McSweeney, who had died on hunger strike. IRA General Headquarters felt Barry's execution, the first in Ireland since the 1916 Rising, could not be allowed to pass off quietly, and Collins ordered attacks to be carried out against Crown forces nationwide the night beforehand. The orders were relayed through official channels to IRA brigades across the country, except for the Kerry No. 1 Brigade. Ty Kennedy, a confidant of Collins's working with the Department of Local Government, was being reassigned as its intelligence officer and was given verbal instructions to deliver to the Brigade OC, Paddy Cahill. As Kennedy was travelling to Tralee, calmer heads prevailed on Collins to rescind the orders. Many parts of the country lacked resources and were not in a position to take on the auxiliaries. While last-minute communications were sent out calling off the operation, County Kerry was overlooked. Kennedy delivered his orders, and on the night of Sunday, the 31st of October, the kingdom was engulfed in a wave of violence. In Abbey Dorney, an RIC constable was shot dead and another died later in the week from his wounds. Two black and tans were shot dead in an ambush at Hillville near Kilorglan, and there were three fatalities following a siege of an RIC barracks at Ballyduff. In Dingle, two black and tans were wounded while an RIC constable was shot through the knee in Tralee and a naval radio operator was shot in the chest. The response was predictable. At Ballyduff, the Black and Tans burned the creamery and the houses of Sinn Féin sympathisers before dragging a teenager from his bed and executing him. In Kilorglan, the Sinn Féin Hall was burned and shots were fired until five in the morning. A man unconnected to the party was taken to the square and shot four times, but survived until the following year. In Tralee, lorries of Black and Tans patrolled the streets, firing indiscriminately. A building on Castle Street known as the 1916 Shop was an obvious target, and this was burned along with the county hall. Unknowns to them, however, two of their own men, 23-year-old Constable Patrick Walters from Galway and Constable Ernest Bright from London, had been abducted by the IRA. They would never be seen again. It's unknown what happened to them, but rumour has it they were executed and their bodies burned at a local gasworks. The atmosphere in Tralee was tense the next morning. The British had hanged Kevin Barry on All Saints Day, a holy day of obligation with great significance in Ireland. Throughout the day, the Black and Tans drove through the town, firing on crowds leaving mass. Volley after volley resounded, to the terror of the people, one eyewitness recalled. Two civilians were wounded and a father of six was shot in the head, though British authorities would later claim he died from a heart attack. There was violence throughout the rest of the county as well. Two IRA volunteers were killed near Artfort, and two RIC constables on patrol at Belly Longford were taken prisoner. The Black and Tans declared that if the two constables weren't released within 48 hours, the town would be razed to the ground. One of them, William Moore, was released immediately, but the other, James Coughlin, was held and tortured until Thursday morning. Moore was so badly traumatised by his experience that he slit his throat with a razor the following month. On Monday evening, the 1st of November, a group of foreign journalists who were staying in Tralee after reporting on Terence McSweeney's funeral began to report on what would soon be known as the Siege of Tralee. Hugh Martin, a journalist with the Daily News who had described British policy in Ireland as the most grotesque comedy, had to use an assumed name as the Black and Tans had threatened to kill him. They found the streets abandoned and that the walls had been plastered with notices which read... Take notice that all business premises, shops, etc. in Tralee must be kept closed and work suspended until such time as the police in Sinn Féin custody are returned. Anyone disobeying this order will be dealt with in a drastic manner. As mentioned already, however, these two policemen were dead. The next morning, Martin fled Tralee for his own safety, and the threats against his life were brought up in the House of Commons. The Chief Secretary for Ireland, Sir Hammer Greenwood, rubbished Martin's claims which were printed in the Daily News and backed up by reports in other papers, declaring, Ireland is the freest country in the world. For journalists. 
In Tralee, all shops and schools were ordered to remain closed as the black and tans drove through the streets, firing into the air. A 24-year-old IRA volunteer who had served with the British Army at Flanders during the First World War was beaten and ordered to get indoors. As he made to do so, he was shot in the back. With authorities later claiming he was shot while trying to escape. A French journalist described how All the afternoon, except for soldiers, the town was as deserted and doleful as if the angel of death had passed through it. I do not remember, even during the war, having seen a people so profoundly terrified as those of this little town. While the Black and Tans took to the streets during the day, a detachment of the Royal Munster Fusiliers stationed at Ballymullen Barracks patrolled the streets at night to prevent them from burning any more buildings. After the army returned to barracks at midnight on Wednesday the 3rd of November, the Black and Tans began a campaign of arson, looting public houses, dousing them in petrol and setting them on fire. Fires were also set in premises whose owners were believed to be sympathetic to Sinn Féin, and these quickly spread to nearby buildings. Anyone who attempted to put them out was shot at. At five in the morning, the Royal Munsters returned and worked to put out the fires, while also providing guard for a number of men that the Black and Tans had forced out of a house. Had they not arrived, the men would most likely have been shot. By Thursday, hunger was beginning to take hold in the town, but the release of Constable James Coughlin by the Bally Longford IRA gave the Black and Tans hope that their methods would secure the release of their two captured comrades. After five days without the ability to get food, people began gathering at bakeries throughout the town on Saturday, hoping that they would be allowed open, but they were dispersed at Bayonet Point by the Black and Tans. The siege was being reported in newspapers across the world, and the Montreal Gazette carried the headline, Town Near Starvation, Condition is Desperate. The British government was now hit with intense questioning in the House of Commons, and their support for sanctioned reprisals was laid bare for all to see. It was no longer able to hide behind a veneer of legalism, as it had with the hunger strike or the execution of Kevin Barry. For several days, the Chief Secretary for Ireland had defended a reign of terror by its police force as it burned, starved and sieged Tralee. On Monday the 8th of November, a select few premises were allowed to open as Hammer Greenwood deflected conditions on who had demanded their closure in the first place. He could either take the blame or admit that the police had done so themselves while the government looked on. The New York World reported that when other shops tried to open the next day, they were met by demonstrations by the police who appeared on the streets shouting and discharging firearms. A black and tan rule had been set up in Tralee. That evening, Hammer Greenwood explained that the police weren't unduly interfering with the conduct of business in Tralee. The reason all the shops were closed was because the young men working in them had gone to the countryside to attack Crown forces. At 8pm, however, notices began to appear throughout the town which read... Business may be resumed in Tralee tomorrow in view of the hardships imposed on loyal subjects. Other means will be resorted to for the recovery of the two police in Sinn Féin custody. Unsure what to make of this, few of the people in the town ventured from their homes during Wednesday morning, trickling out slowly as the day progressed. It wasn't until evening that business resumed fully. The siege had been lifted. The IRA in Kerry had been active during the siege, hitting small RIC patrols, but a few days afterwards they suffered a heavy defeat. At Ballymacalligate Creamery, an attacking party of over 70 men attempted to ambush a convoy of auxiliaries but were driven off, suffering four volunteers killed and another six wounded. The engagement was the fiercest and probably the largest scale of any fight between Crown forces and the volunteers, Dublin Castle proudly announced and footage of the ambush, which was captured by a film crew who just so happened to be with the auxiliaries, was distributed throughout Britain and Ireland. While it showed thrilling scenes of auxiliaries debussing from their vehicles and searching rebel prisoners amidst the bodies of the defeated IRA, eagle-eyed viewers noticed something rather odd. Towards the end of the film, one of the dead Kerrymen could be seen getting up and dusting himself off. People who had never been to County Kerry felt that Ballymacalligat looked familiar, and when a rather distinctive lamppost was spotted in the background, it was realised that what was shown was the Vico Road in Kalini.
Though a minor firefight had taken place at Ballymacalligat between a dozen IRA men and a convoy of auxiliaries, what was known as the Battle of Tralee was a staged propaganda piece carried out by British World War I photographers and filmmakers, in which the parts of the Crown Forces and the IRA were played by an auxiliary company which featured in numerous PR exercises. So good was their work, however, that it continues to be used to this day by publications looking for images of the Black and Tans, making it probably the most famous battle of the War of Independence. By the time the pictures and the film were debunked as fake, other events in Dublin were dominating the news. Still under intense pressure from British intelligence, IRA General Headquarters had identified many of their agents operating in the capital, and on the 21st of November deployed over 200 men to wipe them out. The British response of firing into the crowd and killing civilians at a GAA match would cement the day in history as Bloody Sunday. Accorda, thank you for joining me on The Irish Nation Lives. Slongafole.